Hello and welcome to episode 14 of AS for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. The conversation today is with the architect Malcolm Fraser, founder and director of Fraser Livingston Architects based in Edinburgh. Malcolm's practice focuses on the social, cultural, historical and increasingly ecological context, seeking to balance these with the values of contemporary living. I think um, there's two answers to what queer new vernaculars will come from, and one is about making these neighbourhoods which are walkable and sunny and neighbourly spaces in them. But the second is that we're going to use timber more. We're going to find that's healthier, that's more conducive to our health and our well-being. And you know, where, where does for that care come from? It comes from using materials to hand and doing them in a utilitarian way that suits our lifestyles. So uh, if I look at a, a Scottish village that we love, historic village, it's all about a yard to keep a pig, uh, somewhere to, to dry fishing nets, um, field for common grazing, market to sell uh, vegetables. Um, those are the sorts of places we like and work in the past and work today. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm here with Malcolm Fraser. Uh, Malcolm, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Malcolm Fraser. I'm an Edinburgh architect. Um, I've grown up in a tradition of uh, care for the integrity of place in the city, um, work for conservation practices, but also work for artists, Ian Hamilton Finlay, theoreticians, Chris Alexander, people like that. I, I'd always intuitively seen um, issues that people thought were to do with energy conservation, you know, lagging pipes and putting in insulation. I saw those as being not separate from the care, uh, conservation, and joyful renewal of old buildings, historic cities, towns, places. I always felt that when people talked about eco towns, and tried to build daft things in the countryside that are true eco towns or existing our existing towns and cities, the places with infrastructure, um, the sewers, the schools, etc. And we should care for them before we move on. And I'm pleased to say that things have kind of come around to that. Um, we uh, uh, now now talk about reuse campaigns, etc. And we've started to understand that. Cope in a building, old building in a landfill site, and build a piece of rubbish out past the ring road that's going to fall down the plane road, but with better insulation, nothing to do with sustainability. So, very slowly, and perhaps I don't know, too late or way longer than it should have been, the world is coming around to a rather more holistic uh, view of what sustainability is. And I like to think that the things that I've cared about over all my long practice um, are all kind of coming together with, instead of seeing things as silos, conservation, um, energy matters, um, the interests of towns uh, and regeneration uh, and the climate crisis are not separate, but are part of a single, a larger thing. It's a, that's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. I and you drop in Christopher Alexander in there like it's nothing and in Hamilton Finley, which is quite which is quite fun. And I was watching one of your lectures uh, online uh, from reasonably recently in which you mentioned Christopher Alexander. Um, do you think that he had a major has had a major influence? I mean, his book Pattern Language is hugely important. Um, in general, I think I'm, I'm guessing that that kind of gentle human orientation that he proposes is is there in your work too i, I remember what she has a hadid lecture where she <clears throat> said um people think because i'm a woman that my architecture should be nice i don't want to be nice uh, uh, i think that's the last thing anyone wants to be is nice and uh, you could just see how excited everybody got by this uh, kind of transgressive whateverness. Um, actually, in this world, the radical thing is to say that you do want to make things that are nice. It's a, 
uh, a much denigrated word, but actually in the environment of niceness is about comfort and shelter and uh, the ability to bump into friends and chat and exchange information. Mm. Um, these are the building blocks of my practice, the building blocks of the places where I don't doubt Zaha Hadid went on the holiday and enjoyed um, rather than uh, the sort of sharper, spiky um, expressions of individual egotism, which we're often uh, taught to think of as being proper architecture at school. Um, so I, mean, I don't necessarily want to make uh, too much of it. I, I love the work of um, the most of architects too, but um, there's nothing wrong with setting out to be nice and kind and indeed in relationship to the planet and the environment around us. That's, that's kind of what we need to be to save ourselves from um, disaster. Yeah. So you've just had COP26 in Scotland, in Glasgow, mm -hmm. which I, I hear was confusing, uh, complicated. I mean, what was, did you have any engagement with it? It's kind of uh, something that goes on um, at a certain level. Uh, it, it didn't engage with me, so I... I you know, Did it engage with architects at all? Not particularly, and there's, there's an issue there to talk about, that we're, we're sidelined often in relation to the built environment. We're kind of, uh, as the Scottish Government um, specifically expressed it to me a few years back, uh, were supply chain components, you know, the... The built environment is generally in the hands of bankers, those um, geniuses who nearly crashed the world economy um, 13, 14 years ago, and um, whose sole interest is in creating wealth for the wealthy. Um, bizarrely, these are the people who at the end of the day are still in charge mm. of um, building policy, how we create buildings, how we finance buildings, um, and uh, Architects are just uh, somewhere down the line in order to, to deliver um, a bit of glam as cheaply as possible. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we obviously, if, as a profession, if we believe we are worth more than that, and we know we are, because actually money spent in architecture um, not only can produce a smoother building process and save money, but if we make a hospital where patients um, heal faster, um, get back to work sooner, uh, because you lie in bed and see a tree, uh, you can control your environment by opening a window that sunshine falls onto your bed. Well, that's worth billions to the economy mm. and be worth uh, uh, a few more pennies to the designer if you make a school it's more inspirational, people learn better, um, are calmer and concentrate better, children uh, children work better, and then we produce smarter kids. You know, that's worth enormous amounts of the economy. Um, our professionalism, particularly where it's uh, um, united with the idea of utility, utility goes back to niceness and simplicity, um, making things that work, that are a pleasure to be in, uh, that we think and that are better lit uh, and indeed are better, uh, healthier environments. And I'm sure we'll come on to that, talk about uh, materials, etc. They have uh, um, enormous importance for the built environment and mm. should be celebrated and indeed paid for. And we should be seeking out people who care about these things more. And there's where the importance of the architecture profession comes in. I mean, that, the, I, mean I think you're absolutely correct and i think it's a really nice well to overuse that word but it's a really uh, a p pleasant juxtaposition between the kind of the cheap thin um well uh, zaha hadid gets her name used too much around this but that kind of gl glamour architecture versus a kind of i suppose it's kind of an in a way ordinary architecture an, an architecture of everyday life that is as you say to do with niceness and architecture to me i don't know what you think about this but architecture to me has kind of extracted itself from the general cultural discourse and has allowed itself to be transformed into the plaything of 
economics driven, neoliberal economics driven urban regeneration. So we do the big museum in the squiggly shape and, and then commercial stuff is done everywhere else and very little design gets permitted. You know, yes, um, the, the, we, we make a decision, uh, and I speak to students about this, and it's obviously something that concerns me and should concern them. The vast majority of them will end up delivering shite for uh, big corporate builders um, as a supply chain component for processes that, as I say, are at the end of the day controlled by bankers, or a very, very few of them um, will end up in a kind of conversation, academic conversation about parametricism or, or uh, that sort of uh, um, spillikins, spillikins based urbanism or um, the sort of stuff that universities start, you know, people I know who teach start to talk uh, a language that is deliberately exclusionary um, to, to me even. I don't know what they're talking about sometimes. Uh, and you can see they're doing this because actually the real world of trying to produce nice buildings and do places that make people feel healthy and connected and uh, the sun, sun falls into and things like that is really hard. And you can see if you're driven away from that, then you might try and create a really safe place for yourself. But it's, it's not very much. No, it's got very little to do with delivering ordinary buildings. Although sometimes there's a relationship with the, uh, Zaha sort of spaces where you do get to do the um, squiggly museum um, in the sea of mediocrity uh, that then you overcompensate by showing off too much and becomes too much about a kind of celebrity shape making um, that, that dominates those sort of sectors. Um, so our choices there are limited and, and trying to make space for ourselves we are uh, we are concerned with how we build and what we build and uh, how the walls breathe and things like that. See, and how communities make decisions for themselves. I've been quite active in, uh, in Scotland. I, I led the Cummins Town Centre Review and we helped um, establish the community right to buy, community asset transfers, etc., where abandoned buildings, communities have got hold of and done things themselves within them. Uh, and there are places for young architects, I tell architects, to try and connect to their communities in that uh, abandoned church or uh, um, disused school down the road um, to try and do something with that. Um, looking at people doing um, craft spaces, et cetera, uh, um, all over Scotland, there's really exciting things mm. happening. That's where politics and reuse and sustainability come together and architects can find some purchase uh, to do something which does have that um, uh, social responsibility in it and produces work for them and indeed spaces that we can feel proud of mm. um, having helped recover. I think, yeah, Scotland is, a. I mean, it's a, it's a uniquely... It's a uniquely sort of creative space, a uh, uh, place in that in that way, and and perhaps that's because, I mean, moving down to the southeast of England, where we live in the sort of the shadow of London, where there's a whole different economy really, based around something I can't put my finger on. It's got nothing to do with me, but Scotland certainly felt like there was a, a lot more space for that creative practice, the opportunities for that creative practice. It's obviously not without its problems, but but I was wondering, uh, so. <clears throat> I read your review of town centres, and and as I said, I w I've watched some of your available talks online, and 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 read some of the the papers that you have um, on your on your practice website, um, which are really um, good reads, very clear reads. But one of the things that you promote, as as I suppose, uh, in a way, as a as a as a holistically sustainable strategy, is the idea of the dense city or the dense urban space and you do this beautiful unpacking of the historical development of edinburgh um and it you know it's really really amazing to watch and i learned a lot from watching it but i just wonder whether we we've moved beyond that form of urbanism and whether promoting that form of 
historically dense interconnected city kind of misses the point the technologies have moved on we have the car and the internet and the mobile phone and 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 we like to live separately now um but also in each other's pockets like literally is that a problem well, is that is that can we square the circle how do we square this circle well um it's interesting you talk about Edinburgh. So I, I think my statistics are right. Edinburgh is at one of the one and the same time has the most green space of any British city and is the densest of any British city. Sure. Um, and, and, and these are these are things which we don't just like. We love. Um, you know, you say we like to live separate and uh, have our own house and our own bit of land and stuff like that. But we also like to have a school nearby, to have shops nearby. Um, to have neighbours, uh, we have relationship to to have somewhere to have a barbecue with our pals, um, to have a short walk to work, uh, to not have to commute, um, which uh, um, your indication of the, the car dependent suburban world does, um, to um, to to have a place we feel we, where we belong. Belonging is important. We've fetishized uh, uh, an idea of freedom in this world, um, which is the kind of the ideal of the unfettered self, which ties in with the car and just clearly doesn't work. And it's not it's not a good life lived, lived like that. So um, when you're selling things to people, um, you can sell the, the, this idea of connectivity and neighborliness on a short walk. Um, but, you know, there's builders, house builders, talk, volume house builders talk about curb appeal and they then don't tend to bother that stuff. They just sell something from literally looking at something in a brochure. So it's really down to architects and professionalism again and the planning system to deliver something which gives people what, and I know you're not allowed to say these things, but what they really want, um, because they, they do really want these things. And, a world based upon um, this, uh, uh, dispersed, atomized um, cities, suburbs, doesn't deliver these things and creates a whole uh, raft of problems for us as, as a society. It's not just to do with burning a lot of fossil fuels to get about the place, but it's to do with this connectivity. And I um, mean, you know, one thing that the pandemic has demonstrated to us is that um, we need our neighbours and we need people to know when, we've, when we're have when sick and we can't get messages in, and, sorry, Scots, for, for um, uh, shopping. We can't get the shopping in and things like that. Um, so there's benefits in being able to you know, work from the country uh, off a laptop with um, uh, uh, some digital connectivity, but there's also benefits from being places where you're part of a community, you're part of a neighbourhood. Um, so, but also, Ambrose, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. So we talk about designing um, density and amenity um, and actually saying we can get these uh, close relationships which are dependent on building more densely because if you've, you've only got one person a hectare, you know, it's miles to the school, etc. If you pull that down, then it's much closer. Everything else zooms in with it. Um, so I had a, a, a big stushy, Scots word again, ar argument with Andrus Duaney, who's a sort of royalist celebrity urbanist, uh, American, does these uh, neoclassical themed um, big cities, uh, towns in Florida, etc. Because he, he did the first um, enabling for uh, the Western expansion of Edinburgh. Uh, and basically, he said, you know, it's important to ask people what they want. So he would show them a picture of Granny's Heel and Haim with uh, ivy growing over the door. And then he'd show them a picture of uh, a multi story block in Leith and ask people which they like better. And people would say, well, we like Granny's Heel and Haim. Surprise. So that meant we had to leave the city behind and build on farmland, car dependent way out to the west. And you know, it's a kind of ridiculous thing. And, and I wrote about what was wrong with all this. And he called me out at lectures and said, You're right. He said, Everything my, my, my 
peace in the Scots and that said, everything you said right is right, Malcolm, but you can't build family homes in the city. So this is this American ideal that cities are for the urban underclass and the sex in the city sophisticates and it must be banned by everyone else. But, you know, I grew up in the city. Most of the people in that room grew up in the city. We, we had neighbours, we played in the street, we played in their back gardens, all these things work. Um, so I've seen, in some ways, I've seen some of my career, at least as being a reaction against this. So we came to do um, council housing for uh, City of Edinburgh Council, and we took the traditional colonies form. And the colonies uh, are really interesting. It was a uh, um, local uh, Victorian built working class collectives uh, clubbed together, bought bits of uh, land uh, and built social housing in them for themselves. And they were a flatted form that had a ground floor, uh, a ground floor flat, and then a double upper. One entered from one side at the ground and one entered up a four stair on the other. And everyone had a garden and they were really dense. There's densest tenements but everyone has a garden, their family homes. So we took them and we changed them a little and orientated them so all the gardens faced south and all the north was much more urban and dense. Um, and we've achieved quite high densities on that, but they are definitively family homes, council housing, and some of them are housing association too. We had a bit of a battle around it and that we've, when we do, we've done several wee communities and, we always do this kind of coothy, nice thing that we put a wee village green in the middle. And again, I don't worry that that's a sort of a very unmatchable thing to do. So we put this little village green in the middle and then we had all these terraces south facing of colonies with all the gardens south facing. Um, and uh, one of our clients, uh, I won't say who said, you can't have that village green thing you're calling in the middle. And I said, well, why not? They said, well, Children might play there. She was quite surprised to hear and then had a wee battle with them. And finally they said, uh, well, listen, it's our money. You've got to do what we say. And of course, it's public money. It's our money. And I tried to use all government policies to say we need to encourage children to play and, uh, you know, we use newspaper articles that say the reason the Scotland team was doing so badly was because children couldn't play football, etc. To little avail, we got our village green, but we had to put mounds in it so the children couldn't play football, which was a little distressing. We had to take the benches out so that nobody would sit in the sun. Um, but there is a village green still there, and it's really good social housing. And as I say, it's dense. So um, there's nothing uh, antithetical about <clears throat> putting sunshine and gathering space at the heart of what you do and achieving urban levels of density. And are, are there limits to this though? Because obviously there's there's you know there's the big some of the big modernist post-war mid 20th century kind of estates, places like Park Hill, and you see them in um, central. Well, in there's that big one in Leith. I can't remember its name. Um, great big tower block at the end of the Leith Road. Um, and they're very dense, and I, I, I guess, I guess, maybe they don't quite do what you're talking about. So there's a sort of six-story, five-story domesticity to these buildings, this density that you're talking about. Where so there's a kind of correlation with, I suppose you might call it normative values of what people expect a house to look like. Well, there's, you talked earlier about Chris Alexander, one of his patterns in the pattern language took from a Scottish folk, uh, um, urban folk song. This is one about how um, in the 60s, you, you can't even throw your jelly piece. So that's a kid's jam and bread lunch. You used to throw them out the tenement windows when they were playing uh, um, in the grass below. And you can't even do that above six stories. So that kind of set... Um, a, 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 a definitive limit to height, um, and yeah, you, you know, tenements work up to up to a certain level, and beyond that, they stop working when you're completely detached. Doesn't mean to say that on occasion 
Um, a high rise can do rather wonderful things, and obviously you get fantastic views up there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But there is a sort of, I think Chris was suggesting there, there there is a feel that there is a a usable limit to a density, and indeed we know that many of the densest places. Uh, and there's a famous statistic about London that is Kensington and Chelsea that is the densest. Uh, part of London, but uh, it doesn't have high rises. It just has a good use uh, of the ground plane and indeed has quite a few social spaces and green usable spaces. So um, there's nothing wrong with uh, um, having higher blocks, but as long as they're associated with play space and gathering space, it's well sited to get the sunshine and uh, open and connected and those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, in, in, instead of architects working out how to make things cheaper and nastier and fall down quicker for the benefit of business. If we were putting that sort of the, if we were uh, uh, encouraged to put that sort of an engine or, or put that sort of ingenuity into making spaces that delivered all that. And indeed if planning permission is predicated on how well we made spaces that integrated open space and homes and overlooking and sunshine and neighbourliness. Um, if planning permission was predicated on that, that we get it quicker if we do these things better, then uh, good architects will start to win more work from clients who see that that, that that's that's what they're being encouraged to do. Mm. Yeah, and there's also obviously the architect has to compete against the market as well because. These very cheap houses. This, I mean, uh, living in northern Kent, so I live in the north, north uh, east of Kent, right on the coast here, and they're sort of infilling the entirety of the North Kent coastline. They seem to have de designated it as as a place for for, for sub suburban expansion, and I'm not convinced they're really designing these houses to last more than twenty years, um, but they will last for forty years. But there, for the last 20 years, they'll be probably fairly run down. So, so Ambrose, why would they want to design them to last more than 40 years? It's not in their interest to do that. Mm. I mean, but one of the key words that I have learned to understand the building industry is deal flow. Uh, and people use that seriously. Builders, big construction conglomerates, um, PFI providers, uh, their bankers and lawyers use that negotiation with government, and government knows it needs to speak that language. They want to know deal that, flow. Deal flow. That, that, that there is a river of money, public money and subsidy, going to flow down their throats forevermore. So they want to know that after this PFI deal, what is the next PFI de deal? They want. That school they put up, they want to, they want to have it fall down in 20 years um, so that they can do the next one. Um, that old town, old industrial town, they don't want to see the money going into regeneration. They want to build uh, the new eco town on the fields outside it and uh, soak all the middle class money out of it and uh, go into this new place. Mm. Uh, they want to they, 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 Capitalism wants this endless supply of money, whether it's public subsidy, whether it's uh, um, help help to buy a government subsidy, which is a primary lever for making home prices unaffordable, mm. is by the subsidy we put into it because the market is so uh, unbelievably good at converting that immediately into higher prices. Mm. Um, so it's one of the it's just basically going into higher prices and bigger bonuses for the volume house builders. Um, just... um, so all, all that stuff we're doing is just an endless cycle of putting up shit, uh, demolishing again, and then we'll put up more shit uh, in 20 years. And uh, aside from the economic um, uh, uh, idiocy of it all, we can't. We have depleted the world's resources to such an extent that we can't do that anymore. The landfill sites are full. Uh, this endless cycle of uh, demolition uh, uh, and then saying that this community is failing, run down, demolish, do it again. That doesn't work. Um, and 
in general, you know, we've we've got a, a position of dominance over the world by this arrogant rebuild, rebuild. That that's that's worked for us so far. But what we understand now is the limits. Mm. And that's the point I make about the, the famous William Anders photograph of Earthrise from uh, Apollo 8 in 1968, when you know, they went to the moon and actually what is there is, is dust, as dull as dust. And then they turned their camera back um, to the Earth and just saw this beautiful shimmering blue and green thing that, that we've reached the limit of our expansion uh, and uh, your billionaires blasting out into space are uh, absolutely adding to the problem we have. We're not going to find salvation out there. We need to turn back and conserve, reuse, recycle what we have. And we, you started by talking about our, our, our responsibilities as a profession. We need to be leaders uh, and not, not follow business. We need to question business. Um, and and start again with things, and not just look at what what the the other word that I I use to um, describe the building industry is I've learned is gobons. Have you ever heard this horrific title, Ambrose? Um, no. That, so the first time I worked for the volume house builders, we won a wee competition, and we presented to to uh, their board, and there was a, a shock. Uh, because we'd just done this layout that was all about sunny gardens and about stripping them back and doing them more simply and putting uh, money into uh, better landscaping. And the first question was, Malcolm, where are the gobons? And I was just smart enough at that moment to understand what he meant. He meant the trellises, the half timbering, uh, the pediments, the Prince Charles approved plasters each side of the door, etc. So I said, right, okay, well, we've, we've taken the money from that and we've put it into better landscaping. But it's a really terrible and, and, and fantastically illuminating phrase because you actually see what they do is build a dumb box and gob on it. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's their own view of their, uh, their craft. And I've used it since in articles and the head of uh, um, senior person from their lobby group uh, phoned me up and said, I want to take you out, uh, want to take you out for a bacon roll, he said. It sounded like a threat. Uh, and so we had a bacon roll and he said, I want you to understand how far we've gone. I want you to understand how much we've learned. I said, okay, tell me. And he said, we now do eco-gobbons. Basically what he meant by eco-gobbons was... Um, you know, we windmills or photovoltaics or something like that. And and you can see, just, just to be a bit more forensic about that, you know, what, what the government likes when it's talking about dealing with climate change is something that can bolt on. You know, we, we want to take the thing that we do wrong and bolt something else in it. So um, why they like um, air source heat pumps are a great thing, but they're just... Uh, a pretty dumb bolt-on um, answer to what we're doing wrong with homes. So it's like when we, we're doing a lot of work with um, heavy timber. So we're building out CLT, we're looking at dull laminated timber too, uh, and other forms of heavy timber building. Uh, and uh, um, that, they are there, that, it's really interesting because at the moment, most 99% homes in Scotland are made out of timber kit. And timber kit is engineered down to the thinnest possible uh, bits of wood that'll, that you'll get something to stand up with. So number one, it needs to be uh, Baltic timber that's used for most of it because Baltic timber is slow growing. Scots timber grows too fast because we're too warm here. So that's all got Brexit problems. It's got, obviously, it's non-local economy. There's no certain economy there. All needs to be imported, all the costs, all the local timber's not used. And um, it's also because it's so thin, it needs to be dipped in rock treatment, which is toxic, means it can't be reused or burned when the house falls down. 
Um, uh, and it also, because it still rots, even though it is dipped in this stuff, basically it all needs to be polythene lines. And almost all the homes you build in Scotland are they're basically poly bags. Uh, and issues of respiratory diseases in children are rising because all the vapour, all the CO2, all the particulates are trapped in the home unless you have the windows open and a fan extracting. It's a pretty basic issue. So we design with vapour open insulation, no polythene. And if you use um, Scottish timber, in cross, if you use cross laminated timber, it's vapour open. So all these things go through the wall and leave. It's airtight and vapour open is, is the way to go. Um, harder post Grenfell because bizarrely, uh, you know, most of the people in Grenfell died from toxic fume inhalation because the, the insulation boards in the wall were poly PIR, polyisocyanurate, and the cyan bit stands for cyanide. So we're killing people with cyanide, and because Grenfell, we kill people with these terrible products we use. These not just inflammable, but incendiary aluminium polyethylene mixes in the cladding and these toxic uh, insulations inside. Um, and what, like Sadiq Khan is saying, is you can't build with timber, uh, high rise with timber. It's absolute madness. Um, the question is not how, the question is uh, how, how materials perform in fire and heavy timber performs very well just chars and stays as steel buckles, aluminium buckles, and other things kill people. So we're kind of fighting against all that. But anyway, we're using a lot of, we're doing first private build development in CLT, a tenement in the south side of Edinburgh, and we're using a lot of other timber technologies. We've used CLT for nurseries uh, for University of Edinburgh, we're using it elsewhere. And there's this fantastic research from the continent which shows that children in the timber building, uh, uh, their hearts beat slower than they do in a, uh, uh, um, in a plaster line building. Uh, and that means concentrate better. It's like 8,000 fewer heartbeats a day. Their concentration is better, their exclusion is better. Um, they learn better. Now, of course, adults aren't different from children. It's just the natural way to go. And I know in what you said before, Anne, there was a question about um, uh, new vernaculars, etc. I think um, there's two answers to what where new vernaculars will come from. And one is about making these neighbourhoods which are walkable and sunny and have, na have uh, um, neighbourly spaces in them. But the second is that we're going to use timber more. We're going to use fast growing Scottish timber up here, certainly, and in England too. And we're going to find that's healthier, that's more conducive to our health and our well being to make environments with exposed timber in it. Um, and you know, where, where does for that kind of come from? It comes from using materials to hand and doing them in a utilitarian way that suits our lifestyles. So uh, if I look at a, a, a Scottish village that we love, historic village, it's all about a yard to keep a pig, uh, somewhere to, to dry fishing nets, um, field for common grazing, a market to sell uh, vegetables. Um, those are the sorts of places we like and work in the past and work today. We're, we've got to build a new vernacular, mm. our neighbourliness and um, uh, so we're nice to have a coffee with your pals and those sorts of things. And and there is therefore, I suppose, a, a, a culturally contextual requirement in these things. You've talked a lot about the Scottish example, and obviously Scotland has this tradition of tenement housing, this mid-rise or low mid-rise housing, which is a phenomenal typology. I mean, it's just absolutely amazingly um, rich experience to live in and, and um, in sort of accommodate so many in one building so many different activities and socioeconomic groups and so on but in all of this stuff that you're talking about there's a kind of am i right or would it be fair to say there's a kind of 
attitude against the universalizing, generalizing principle of high modernism, that we've got to get back to something that's much more to, to, to create sustainable cities, to create sustainable architecture and the spaces in between. We've got to get back to something that corresponds to a, a closely discerned, sensitively articulated idea of cultural context. I, I, that's a complicated question. Uh, it depends Thank you. What you mean by <laughs> high modernism. Um, you know, if high modernism is Mies van der Rohe, um, beautiful engineer buildings, perhaps um, if the current expression of high modernism, you could say, is uh, uh, the work of Norman Foster. And, you know, I, I look at um, him talking about sustainability, my jaws on the floor because. Well, foster buildings are almost predicated on uh, their heavy use of energy, their unsustainability. And, you know, there will, there will be a, a new building that is based on knocking down a good old one and uh, has as its kind of founding principle, never use a piece of wood when a piece of aluminium will do. There's a kind of fetishizing of uh, um, energy use, etc. So, having been unfair <laughs> or whatever, um, you know, the, 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 there is there is not just the strain of modernism, but um, absolute central part of modernism is the ideal of healthy places, of uh, social mixing, of democratic space, um, of sunshine and light. Uh, and uh, an obsession with the health of fresh air, um, sunshine and views and those sorts of things. So that's, that's for me, that's uh, absolutely alive part of modernism. And in my work, I basically try in my own wee way of allying that with a concern for repair and reuse of historic patterns of building, of old places and their neighborliness and their existing infrastructure. But when I build a new unit um, or uh, integrate new bits or, or open out old buildings, um, I think about those modernist principles uh, of democratic space and sunshine and light. Mm. I, I don't find them, I don't find them incompatible. In fact, I find them compatible. I think it's, it's a, a, a gestalt of um, looking at uh, the world with care and concern and think of it as a resource that needs to be um, looked after and carefully renewed um, in those positive modern ways. Yeah. Well, that's really beautiful. And I'm, um, I think it's a lovely description, both of your own work and your own perspectives on it and the sort of potential, I think, for, for, for our, our young students we do get kind of blind well not blindsided you get kind of blinded by the light of these stellar architects the kengo kumas and the and the frank Gehrys and 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 even people like rem coolhouse as as competent and a genius he is there's a kind of sense that we've got to get to be a true architect you've got to be virtuosic to the nth degree and anti-contextual or um or con contextual in the negative, if you know what I mean, like reflecting back on the indigenous native contextual forms by doing the opposite kind of thing. We saw that discussion, I always thought, in the in the Stephen Hall building, uh, designed building, uh, the Shona Reed Art School, where there was a kind of uh, a justification of a building that was totally different to the building over the road from it by explaining that it was the same, just the opposite. Um, you know, it was like <laughs> heavy bones and and uh, and uh, a whatever it was, light 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 shell, and then a heavy shell and a light bones. And I, I think, yeah, I think we've, yeah, for me, your work has always been kind of um, inspiring because it's it's very architectural, it's very designed, and it's very evidently highly designed work. But it's also got this, dare I say it, the voice of the common person, you know, the, uh, um, it's not, um, it's not scorning what people love. 
Well, I just like to do what I understand and uh, work in ways I understand. Um, so, uh, uh, and I feel that there's an integrity to how we work, which I'm, I'm comfortable with. Um, and uh, there is there is room for there is still room within it for a, a bit of glamour and showing off. Mm. It doesn't need to necessarily be by me, but at no point am I ever going to think that what I'm doing is of less importance or secondary um, to the, the more showy offy bits, uh, because I think we need to relearn the art of uh, building the simplicity and utility and integrity. And I'm very much focused on that. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Malcolm. That was wonderful. Nice to see you again. It's Cheers. lovely to see you too. That was great. And what a lush accent, hey? Thanks indeed to Malcolm. Please follow the links in the podcast description to see Fraser Livingston Architect's work and for Malcolm's written pieces we referenced. Go and see Malcolm speak too if you can. It's always worth the entry fee. And please like, follow, subscribe and share this podcast with literally everyone in the known world. Cheers. Cheers.